worship. Anybody like that here? Yeah? You are anybody? Let me hear you say it loud and clear. <laughs> That every one of you from now on you will begin to excel. Amen. Who is the one fellow that you will stand beside him or her? Say, you are the one who will get my attention. allows you to enter into overflowing blessings. Redemption Way. The Lord is going to surprise someone here tonight. Join Pastor E.A. Adeboye and other men of God every first Friday of the month as they lead multitudes of worshippers to the presence of God in the monthly Holy Ghost service at the Redemption Camp, Kilometer 46, Lagos Ibada Expressway, from 6.30 p.m. to 3. You're watching Redemption Way. chapter 3, reading from verse 7 to 11. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do condemn but dumb, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead Paul said I want to know him. Everybody knows that it is a common adage that knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. And ignorance is destruction. The word of God says that people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is power. In 1963, I was a teacher at Ondo Boys High School, Ondo, teaching with school sat. And I was out of the 50 lessons, 40 lessons in a week, I was teaching 35, which means I do not really have much to breathe throughout the day. 
and then there was this young graduate then older than I but young who was teaching 21 classes out of 40 and he was complaining so I went to him and I said sir I am teaching 35 and I'm being paid 17 pounds 10 you are teaching 21 and you are being paid 60 pounds he looked at me and smiled he said I'm being paid for what is there I'm being paid for what is in my head you go to the university come out then they begin to pay you for knowledge so when Paul said I want to know him he was already an apostle so if an apostle says I want to know Jesus then where do I stand? I'm an ordinary pastor. Where do you stand? Some of you are not even deacons yet. Now there are many aspects of Jesus that I don't blame Paul if he says, I want to know him. There's an aspect of him that says he is the Savior Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 Matthew 1 21 says you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins there is the aspect of him that says he's the healer there is the aspect of him that says he's the deliverer and so on and so forth so what aspect of him then did Paul want to know? I have a rough idea. I think he is interested in the aspect of Jesus Christ that says is the truth. Because Paul was a lawyer. I'm sure he was interested in the truth. Jesus said in John 14 verse 6, John 14 verse 6, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He wanted to know more about the truth. And now since this is the year of Jubilee, and the Bible says in John chapter 8 verse 32, John 8 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free and the year of Jubilee is the year of freedom I think the year of Jubilee should be the year of truth so tonight by the special grace of God we want to focus on that aspect of Jesus Christ that is called the truth is there anyone here tonight who wants to hear the truth uh, raise your hand if you are one of them I said yes I want to hear the truth <laughs> are you sure because the truth can be bitter Several years ago, some an organization said they wanted me to come and talk to them about, they wanted me to come and raise funds for them to finish a church building. I told them I don't know how to raise funds. They said, You don't know how to raise funds, and you build the camp. I said, I'm not the one who built the camp, it is God. And they said we know that uh, God used people. I said yes. He used my people. And whatever you are telling your people that caused them to build a camp, come and tell us. I said ah. I tell my 
tell people the truth. Ah, they said that's what we want to hear. I said, ah. <laughs> hey. You want to hear the truth? I can't hear your answer now. So I went to them, and they insisted. And when I got there, I told them that all sins are terrible to God. But there are three that He hated most. <laughs> they began to look at me. We asked you to come and raise money, and you are talking about sin. So I told them the three things. That's not the sermon of tonight, because I'm not here to respond. At the time I finished, they wish they didn't invite me. However, in less than 30 minutes, they raised four billion naira because I told them the truth. talk about truth there are levels of truth when you go to the primary school you go to learn some truths you go to learn 2 plus 2 equals 4 when you go to the secondary school you want to learn more you go to the university, you go to another level. Ask anybody who didn't do too much of mathematics, what is 2 plus 2? The answer is 4. Ask somebody who got to my own level of mathematics, and you say, what is 2 plus 2? He will ask you at what speed. Because when speed begins to move close to the speed of light, 2 plus 2 is less than 3. But that's uh, something else. <laughs> well, that's not what we are here to discuss tonight. So God helping me, we will begin with basic truths, then we move on to secondary truths, and then to a little bit of uh, higher truths, because we must come higher. Check basic truths. Number one, nothing goes for nothing. Everybody knows that. The Bible tells us clearly that salvation is free. By grace you are saved. Ephesians chapter 2. Read it from verse 5 to 8. Not of works, so that nobody can boast. It is free. Salvation is free. But, nothing goes for nothing. Because salvation is free only because someone paid for it. Who paid for your salvation? Ah, thank you. First John chapter 1 verse 7. First John chapter 1 verse 7. He said, it is blood that cleanses from all sins. He said, this is my blood shed for you. He shed his blood to buy your salvation. Healing is free. Divine healing. If healing comes from God, it is free. You don't believe me? Go read Second Kings chapter 5. And see what will happen to anyone who tries to sell the healing that comes from God. Naaman got his healing free. He brought money. Elijah.
Elisha said Thank you very much sir Really I received Really I gave He as I said no If my master would not take the money For healing this man I would take the money Fine He got the money And got the leprosy Healing is free If it's coming from God But Someone paid For it First Peter chapter 2 verse 24 First Peter 2 verse 24 Says by his stripes We were Healed Who paid for your healing? Divine prosperity is free. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. Proverbs 10, 22 says, The blessings of the Lord make it rich and added no sorrows. If it is coming from God, it's free. No sorrows attached. Because someone paid. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Second Corinthians 8, verse 9. He said, I became poor that through my poverty you might become rich. So if you look at the anthem for the convention, you see there, come out of sin, don't waste my blood. Come out of pain, don't waste the strife I took for you. Come out of poverty because I became poor that you might become rich. Nothing goes for nothing. Pure, basic truth. Pure, basic truth in the scripture says it is possible, it is possible never to be sick again. In the year of Jubilee, you can receive your healing. And it is possible never to lose that healing. Exodus 15:26. Exodus 15:26 says, If you will happen diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all that He commands you, He said, He will bring no sickness upon you. Because it's the Lord that heals you. He can make sure that for the rest of your life you live completely free of sickness. It is possible to enjoy prosperity for the rest of your life. It is possible. This one of the chapters, chapter 28. Verses 1, 2, 11, and 12. This one number 28, verses 1, 2, 11, and 12. If you have been diligent to the first of the Lord your God to observe and to do all that He commands you, He says, Blessings will follow and pursue you and overtake you. He said, You will learn to nations and you will never borrow. Basic truth. Now let's move to secondary truths. Just a little bit of it because we don't have all night. One of the things I probably just mentioned on the secondary truth is that there are two forces, two powerful forces controlling life. One is called curses, the other is called blessings. Just those two. They can determine what will happen to you. What is a curse? A curse is an invitation to all forces in heaven, on earth, under the earth, to work against someone. Because it's to say to angels, demons, to every force 
just make sure that this fellow will not succeed. That's what the cause is. You need to do is read Deuteronomy 28. Read it from verse 14 to the end. And you see what happens when a man is cursed. Deuteronomy 28, 14 to the end. And you see a classical example in Genesis 29, verse 1 to 4. Genesis 29, verse 1 to 4. When Jacob was talking to his children, he said, he said Come, I'm about to die. All of you gather together, my children. Let me tell you your future. And he looked at him, Ruben, the first one. He said, Ruben, you have everything going for you. Powerful, excellent, etc., etc. He said, But I say, you shall not excel. You're number one. Everything, everything number one is supposed to be is already in you. But when someone is under a curse, everything he touches fails. And I pray for all of you who are here today. If there's any curse that is still left in your life. In this year of Jubilee, may be destroyed in Jesus' name. And the curse flows down like a river. If it is pronounced on one man, God have mercy on his children and grandchildren. Because he keeps going down. As the people of Jericho, they will tell you. Second King chapter two, verse nineteen. Second King chapter two, verse nineteen. He said to Elisha, "Our city is beautiful, as you can see. Everything on the surface is looking good, but that's where the goodness ends. <laughs> Inside the water is bitter. Everything is." We, we, we're just suffering. Why? Because we are in the past. Joshua, in Joshua chapter 6, verse 26, Joshua 6, verse 26, I pronounced the curse on the city. The curse kept on flowing down like a river. The other force, which is the opposite, of course, it's a blessing. And that's why I smile when I hear people say, I was lucky. There's something called luck. You are either cursed or you are blessed. Two forces. One is working on for you or the other. Is working against you. What is a blessing? A blessing is a summon to all forces in heaven, on earth, underneath the earth to support somebody and make sure he succeeds. That's what a blessing is. So when somebody is blessed, every door he knocks. It's open. Where others are having difficulties, when a blessed person arrives, oh, things are easy. You want an example? Read Genesis 27, verse 26 to 29. Genesis 27, verse 26 to 29. There you see Isaac. Blessing Jacob. What did he say? He said, Let our passes be your favor. Dew of heaven, fatness of the earth. He said, Let people serve you. Let nations bow down to thee. He said, The Lord over thy brethren. Let the children of your man bow down to you. 
He said, those who cost you are already cost. Those who bless you are blessed. When someone is blessed, nobody can stop him. Blessing, the blessing can pick the younger and make him superior to the elder. Is there? And Genesis 48, verse 13 to 20. Genesis 48, verse 13 to 20. You see, two children. One, the firstborn, Manasseh, the other, Ephraim. They were brought to their grandfather for blessing. And he placed the blessing of the firstborn on the secondborn. And within a short period of time, the younger one was ten times more prosperous than the elder. You read it. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17. So you see that when you look at Deuteronomy 28, and you read it from verse 1 to 13, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1 to 13, you see all the works that a blessing can do. When you are blessed, enemies that come against you will be destroyed without you fighting. That's what, it, that's what the Bible says. It said, the enemies that rise up against you shall be smitten before your face. You are not the one fighting them. Forces that are assisting you will smite them. When you are blessed, he said, you'll be heard, you won't be there. That's why. If there's anything at all you want from your father before he dies, this is blessing. If your father, your mother, and just say, God bless you, my son. God bless you, my daughter. Oh. You can, go, can begin to rejoice. It's much more than giving you money. Because money can finish. But blessing will open doors. Of course, it costs you something to get blessing. Because nothing goes for nothing. <laughs> like I used to say to my children, I can bless you on credit. I can bless you first and then you can come and set to me later. So all of you who are here tonight, be blessed in Jesus' name. But where I'm going really tonight is a higher level of truth. Because this is the year of Jubilee. And the Lord has told me that this is one convention none of us will forget. And if we are not going to forget it, then we need to know the truth. After all, the elders have they say, if two children of the same mother went into a room and they come out smiling, it means they have not been telling each other the truth. <laughs> so if by the time we finish tonight you are not smiling at me, no problem. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Whether the devil likes it or not, in the name that is above every other name, this year of Jubilee, you shall be free. is this higher truth that I'm talking about? You see, when you say the year of Jubilee is the year of release, that is true. Slave owners will say to slaves, go, you are released. It's the year of Jubilee. But nothing 
goes for other things. The slave is free. The slave owner suffers a loss. The year of Jubilee is the year of restoration. Your land that you have sold because you ran into some financial problems will be restored to you. It's the year of restoration. As Jubilee, you gain. Somebody loses. Nothing goes for nothing. But the year of Jubilee is actually the year of restitution. And restitution is a word nobody wants to hear. We want to hear about salvation. We want to hear about healing. Yes, we want to hear about power. We want to hear about breakthrough. Nobody wants to hear about restitution. And the year of Jubilee is the year of restitution. It's the year when what is not your own, what you got from somebody else, must be restored to the owner. Consider the law of harvest. The preacher told us, Galatians 6 verse 7 says, basically, whatever you sow, you reap. Galatians 6 7. Basically, he says, how much you reap is determined by how much you sow. Give and you shall be given. You have see that. Uh, Scattered and yet increased. The man who took the offering told us that if you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. Second Corinthians chapter nine verse six. Second Corinthians nine six. And he says it will be determined by how good the ground that you sow is, sow it into is. That is true. Matthew 13, verse 3 to 9. Matthew 13, 3 to 9. But, the Bible says, in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, Hosea 8, verse 7, he says, if you sow wind, you will reap the wild wind. does not cancel the law of harvest. That is the year of Jubilee does not mean that if you sow, you will reap. If you sow the wind, get ready for the wild wind. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 to 12. Second Samuel 12, verse 1 to 12. David killed Uriah with the sword so that he can get his wife. God said, David, I like you. You are a man after my own heart. But you killed this man with the sword. He said, the sword will never depart from his house. David killed only one man. God said he would swear to be there forever. There is only one way to avoid harvesting evil that you have planted. That's if you go quickly to where you plant it and uproot it. If you think that the seed you sowed is gone, then you don't even know the basic laws of agriculture. Every seed must have a harvest. That's why those who don't eat, don't know the reason they remain poor. The harvest is gone. And the same is true not only 
only physically and materially, it is true spiritually. That which you sowed is waiting in the future, unless you can restitute your ways. Paul was speaking and he said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 25. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. He said, I went to prison often. They stoned me. They beat me. <laughs> he was reaping what he sowed. He was the chairman when they were stoning Stephen. He threw many Christians to prison. Now he's an apostle. That did not cancel the law of harvest. When he prayed to God, God, when we all this beating and prison and stoning, and God said, hey, My grace will be sufficient for you. Possession, money that you stole, things that do not belong to you that you maneuvered. You see your position. If you love yourself, if possible, for the end of this week, restitute. Because as long as that contamination is in your money, the bad money will destroy the good work. You don't believe me? Ask Achan in Joshua chapter 7. He took that which God said, don't touch, and added it to something. He hid it. He thought nobody would know. There's another truth that I uh, don't have time to go into. There's nothing hid that will not come into the open. Nothing hid. If you thought you did it and nobody will ever know. <laughs> so he can grab something that didn't belong to him, put it into. Instead, the unfortunate thing is that when it was time for him to die, he didn't die alone. He took all his children with him. If you think that what you have done, the evil that you have done, the money you have stolen, the thing you brought by wrong means because nobody saw you is gone forever. Think again. And there is something that is not yours that is in your possession for you to enjoy this year of Jubilee. Go and restitute. You took another man's wife. Into your home. When you get home, read Genesis chapter 12, verse 11 to 20. Genesis 12, 11 to 20. And you will see what happened to somebody who did something similar and what he had to do. Before his problems were over. But let me, let me move on. That's dangerous ground, isn't it? There are many of us who claim prophecies. The prophecies will come. And you know that you know that to go, this is for me. And yet, you wait 
and wait and wait for fulfillment and you don't see it and say what's going on Samuel chapter 2 verse 30 For Samuel chapter 2 verse 30 God said To Eli He said I said indeed I'm the one who said so That you and your father's house Will stand before me Forever He said but now I said be far from me I, I, I changed my mind Joshua chapter 1 Read it from verse 1 to 5. Joshua 1, from verse 1 to 5. God said to Joshua, Joshua, no man will ever be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Nothing can be plainer than that. God said it to him directly. He didn't send Pastor Adebuy. He said it himself. Joshua, you will win all battles. And then they go to I. And they fled before the enemies. Joshua fell on his face and said, God, what's happening? This is not what you told me. And God said in verse 12, He said, Because something that has crept in and unless that thing is removed I won't go with you anymore
Genesis 22 verse 1 to 18 What said to Abraham Give me your son Isaac That you love And sacrifice him Abraham said okay You gave me You want him You can have him Tied up the boy Raise up the knife God said alright alright just a test you have passed he said now I swear that the blessing I'm about to pronounce on you will never be reversed he said I swear when we talk about first fruit some of you think it is uh, a gimmick by starting the first fruit of increases, first fruit sacrifice. This man says, God, you can have it all. And God says, All right, I bless you irreversibly. I think I've said what God wants me to say. Come up higher. How do I go higher? You can go higher. And at the same time, allow those things that want to keep you down to stay. Anyone who wants to rise must get rid of weights. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 10. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 10. You want to go up? Get rid of certain things. Read this, read the passage. When you get to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Says, <laughs> you want to run this race? The weights that will hold you down, you must get rid of them. Several years ago, several years ago. God taught me about this institution practically. I went to UI to conduct a Bible study. When we got to a Bible, because I wanted to leave UI very early the following morning, we branched at a petrol station to fill up my tank. Unknown to us, that particular petrol station had water and petrol mixed together. We just filled it up and went to UI. The following morning, we started the car. The car started. Put it in gear to go forward. It curved and stopped. Again and again and again. My friends that I stayed with called the university mechanical engineer who took my car to their station and they checked and they said, Aha, there's water in the carburetor. It's only fluid that's supposed to be there. What am I going to do? I'm in a hurry, they said, sir. <laughs> no hurry to be. They took down the tank, drained the fuel, separated water from petrol, poured the petrol, fixed the tank again, poured the petrol, and said, Now you can go. As long as water is mixed with your petrol, you are not going anywhere.
Those of you who are here who are still living in sin, you are not even born again yet in your case. <laughs> and you think that oh, I'm going to the convention, the Lord is going to use my Swadibri for me. Can we continue in sin and expect grace to abound? People say, God forbid. So if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you want his blood to wash away your sins, so that all things can pass away and all things can become new, come now. If you are born, if you are born again once, but you are already backsliding, you are already doing those things that you say you will never do again, come, come to the Almighty God, let him cleanse you one more time. Brethren, why these people are coming? Begin to think of those things, those areas where you need to restitute. Because unless you get rid of that which should not be with you, how can you possibly go higher? So if you want to give your life to Jesus, come now. Jesus, mighty name, we have prayed. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for these people who have come forward to surrender their lives to you tonight. I thank you because you said, whoever comes unto you, you will no wise cast out. They have come. Please receive them in Jesus' name. Whatever they've done wrong in the past, your blood that cleanses from all sins, let the blood wipe them clean in Jesus' name. Save their souls and write their names in the book of life in Jesus' name. Grace never to go back into sin. Please give to them in Jesus' name. And if there be any backsliders among them, Lord, restore fully in Jesus' name.